Let's jump into the Word of God this morning. I'm going to preach a message uh, titled Abundant Crops. And um, what we want to do is we want to see God work mightily in our midst. And, but there's a price to pay uh, to see God work in our midst. I'm just going to be in one verse in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is in your Old Testament. Proverbs is a good book to read. The first few chapters kind of laying out uh, what wisdom is and even personifies uh, kind of uh, in a poetic way wisdom and, uh, and contrast wisdom kind of like as a good wife, as a... As, a, as, a, as the kind of a wife a man would want to have with, uh, with uh, the earthly um, knowledge and things, uh, and things that are not of this world or of this world and not of God and contrast that with like a prostitute or a harlot the Bible will talk about. And so we want to be a people who are wise and, and, and w- with insight. And so as you get back to probably chapter 10 and on or maybe chapter 9, uh, you get into uh, Proverbs, and they just got one verse, you know, one verse at a time. So if you read a chapter, it's not like you're getting a story or you're getting one coherent thought. You're getting no, every verse almost is, is, a, is a different thought. So we're going to be in chapter 14, verse 4 uh, this, uh, today. So turn with me there, Proverbs chapter 14, uh, beginning and, and ending with verse 4. Stand with me, if you will, as we read God's Word today. God's Word is powerful. And we stand in reverence and uh, to acknowledge the significance of the Word of God in our life. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Uh, let's read. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Let me read it one more time with just one verse. Chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we know that whether it be a verse or a chapter or a book or the whole uh, tenor of Scripture, Lord, that your word has a way of changing things, Lord. By a word, you created the universe, and by a word, you created us. And so this day, Father, we pray that your word, that with that same power, would shape us and form us into your likeness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, a lot of times I'll give you the context of a scripture, and uh, that's the thing about Proverbs is there's not really any context. It's just Proverbs. It's just wisdom verse by verse. It's about wisdom. Uh, And I I will tell you, though, and if you've been around for any amount of time, you've probably been witness to the fact that we live in a day and age when wisdom is lacking and specifically godly heavenly wisdom is lacking uh, a lot of people will tell you that uh, 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 what what James says and I want to tell it to you as well James says if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask the father above for wisdom and he will give you wisdom from heaven all right where does wisdom begin it begins with god the creator of all things he knows how things are to operate he knows how things are to be and so he gives that wisdom uh i i referenced the the first part of of the book of proverbs uh uh, as and it talks about a young man and a a godly woman or having a, a good wise woman which is wisdom and then it contrasts that with having an adulterous woman and the desires of the flesh and that we should be going for wisdom all right not the wisdom of this world but the godly wisdom so you get here each verse kind of is a sermon in and of itself uh and and not necessarily any contrast but or or context but i want to look at this verse four uh that says where there are no oxen the manger is clean but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox now one of the things you got to understand about proverbs and really a lot of scripture even in the psalms and stuff and and in revelation that there are times where uh scripture is saying something it is using illustration if you will of things that we would all know or at least the people the original listeners would would readily pick up on and uh, using that as illustration to something more significant something that is stronger and uh, something that is more spiritual in nature a truth all right and that's the same thing here so here you're talking about oxen and mangers and crops all this kind of it's kind of like jesus talking about the seed on the on in the different kinds of soil okay he's not he's not giving these the the farmers listening tips on how to be a farmer he's using things that they already know to illustrate spiritual truths 
Okay, and this is the same thing. So he's taking this farming culture that he's that, that's being spoken to, and he's speaking to them in terms that they will understand, and taking these realities and applying them to spiritual truth. So let's make a couple, uh, uh, not more, just a couple, but a few observations uh, from this passage right here. Number one, you should want a large harvest. You should want a large harvest, even though it's hard and messy we need to keep asking ourselves as we go through ministry and operating as the body of christ and as christians in the world who are called to fulfill the great commission and that is what is our mission what is our purpose what did jesus send us to do what is most important and i want to tell you that if we're talking about that jesus said i've come to seek and to save the lost That's why Jesus came, and thou by his provision, the sacrifice that he made, we too are called to be participants in what Jesus came to do. In fact, before he ascended back into heaven, he told his disciples, and he gave them the great, what we call the great commission. I like that it's co-mission. In other words, he's now inviting us to partner with his mission in the world. And he said, I've come uh, to seek and to save the lost. All right. He paid for that. He provided that the lost need no longer be lost, but they can be born again. They can be adopted into the family. They can be redeemed from darkness. Hallelujah. No matter who they are. And we ought to desire that that which is called the harvest would be something that which is evident to us today that we want a great harvest, that we won't be settled for a little harvest or a few harvests spread over many years, but we want to be a part of a great harvest. And if we're going to be a part of a great harvest, we're going to have to deal with the fact that it's going to be hard, it's going to be messy sometimes. When something is difficult or costly, we have the tendency sometimes to cut corners. We have the tendency to to try to try to get get out of the effort get out of the work get out of the hardship of it but there are some things that are just worth the time and energy and attention to see a great harvest i um when i was young i mowed uh, mowed our yard in fact i mowed a few yards in our in our neighborhood in our community that and uh, made a little bit of money from it as a young teenage boy and and uh, but one of the things that i hated doing was mowing our own yard Guess what? Because I didn't get paid for mowing my own yard. I didn't want to mow that yard. And so I would often try to take shortcuts. In fact, my dad started calling me Shortcut Jared because I was trying to take shortcuts. I would mow the yard, and if you had a 22-inch mower, that means that there was 22 inch. Every time you took, you drove that, uh, uh, it wasn't a driving, it was a push mower. Every time you push that mower through the yard, it would take no more than 22 inches of grass. So what you could do is you could go less than that. You could mow five inches of grass or 15 inches of grass, but you couldn't mow any more than 22 inches of grass. So what I would try to do sometime is I would try to get a little bit more than 22. And so I would mow about 23, and then, and then as I, when I would mow 23, I, could, I would have a, you know, an inch or so left out that would just kind of shave. And the idea I was hoping was that that would be just, you know, uh, unnoticeable you wouldn't catch on to that but um, but the the, it, the reality was I was trying to take a shortcut on the work I didn't want to do the work uh, that was necessary and if we want to see a great harvest listen there's no way around it it requires effort on our part it requires time it requires energy it requires intentionality and there's no shortcut to revival there's no shortcut to seeing a harvest come in you either have a harvest or you don't have a harvest there's no shortcut in it so ultimately we see doing what we're supposed to do when we're trying to take shortcuts and if we want to see a great harvest it's going to be hard and it's going to be messy sometimes jesus said the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few there's much at stake if the harvest is plentiful if there's harvest available what we need are people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get into the harvest and do the hard work of 
harvesting that which is available. I am fully convinced that while we are in the end times, there is an opportunity for another great awakening in the hour in which we live, in the hour in which we minister, if God's people are willing to do the hard and messy work of being out in the harvest, as opposed to being comfortable, as opposed to being safe, as opposed to of all the other things I've uh, shared uh, testimony over and over. You know, there's something about the simple witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its impact in our lives. And a lot of the times what we can do is we can get so caught up in doing something big. Let's say I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher, and so I want to do something big for the kingdom. I want to be a part of a great awakening. I want to be a part of this great harvest. And so, Lord, help me to accomplish what Billy Graham accomplished. But that's not what God's called me to do. God's called me to something different. And what I begin to recognize is, Lord, wherever I'm at, wherever you plant me, wherever you lead me, wherever you guide me, whatever place you guide me into, I want to be faithful in that place with the simple gospel message and the simple witness. But even outside of the pulpit, I want to be faithful to what God has called me, one-on-one, just simply sharing my testimony. A lot of times it's a good thing to start with questions. Ask people, where, where do you feel like you're at spiritually? Where do, you, where do you feel like you're at in your relationship with the Lord? What values, begin to evaluate, what values do they currently have? And those kinds of things. To be just simply a witness to Christ. I want to become more spiritually minded, less organized religion minded. I want to be more concerned about the will and the purpose and the mission of God than I am about institutions and organizations. Oftentimes, by the third and fourth generation, uh, what happens to churches is, is that they get stuck in the mode of just preserving the institution. And they forget that the church is not the church unless it's fulfilling the Great Commission. And once we get our eyes off the Great Commission, listen to me, once we get our eyes off the Great Commission, then we look to institutional preservation and we've already lost the spiritual battle and given ourselves over to spiritual defeat and death because we've lost sight of the calling of God upon our lives we ought to want a large harvest even though it's hard and even though it can be messy number two observation I'd give to you is that clean stables are not the priority a clean manger is not the goal ministry is messy it's hard now i'll just say um uh, that the reality is things break things wear down people the more people that you have do you know the more people that come to your church the more difficult it is to keep things clean the more difficult it is to keep things running things get broken kids break things sometimes kids wipe their hand on the wall kids take crayons to the, the wall and, and kids take markers to the wall but listen to me there's a whole lot of churches that are nice and clean and there's no young people in the churches see the goal is not that the manger would be clean the clean stables are not our priority yes i think it's important that we have a facility and a property and things that bring glory to god but that's not our ultimate goal our ultimate goal is that the harvest would come in and sometimes those that come in are messy and sometimes those that come in are broken and they don't know how to act and sometimes those that come in come in and they've got issues in their life that are difficult things that have kept them bound up for a long time and that's though the harvest that's working in the harvest uh, some of you may uh, be aware that uh, I'm not really a handyman. Uh, I'm just not. I'm not good at uh, a handyman kind of a things. And if something breaks at our house, then my wife knows that she can tell me about it, and I've got to go get somebody else to make it happen. There are a very limited amount of things that I can do. And so if you would go now, like, like any manly man, I've got to have a toolbox, though. Just because I don't know how to work all those tools doesn't mean that I don't have those tools. And, and uh, my tools are probably limited, no doubt, but I have these different tools. And, and so, but what you'll notice about the tools that I have, whether it be my drill or um, my hammer or some of these other tools, that unless I receive them from somebody else and they were already used, you'll notice that they're in really nice shape. They're in very nice shape. 
because they're not used. They don't have paint on them. They don't have rust on them. They don't have nicks in them. They don't have, uh, they're not broken because I've, I've just not used them very much. They've not been utilized. And so uh, they're, they're in really good shape. They're really nice. And somewhere along the way, if we're not careful, our eyes will shift from the mission of the harvest that gets messy. It's out there on the fringes. It's out there where it's difficult. And it's out there where people are really hurting, where people are really living. And we get to these places and we're getting these circumstances and these situations. And we have to ask ourselves, okay, God, this is the fringe right here. This is awkward because people come into the church or people that we're dealing with, they don't know how to talk right. They're using vocabulary that they shouldn't be using. And they don't know how to, how to operate as a Christian they don't know how to live right and it's awkward for us because we don't sometimes know how to, to interact with them we don't know how to, what to tell them or what to say to them yes it gets a little messy but put aside your comfortability and say it's more important to be a part of the harvest work and at the end of the day if you come into the workshop of Jesus you'll find tools that are scuffed and tools that are dirty and tools because they've been used to repair and bring healing and to bring wholeness to people See, a clean manger, that's not the goal. Stalls that aren't messy, that's not the goal. The goal is that we minister. In some cases, cleanliness is not next to godliness. It's next to ungodliness. Let me give you a, a third observation. It's about time we need, or that we make a mess. It's about time that the church makes a mess. Uh, I don't know about you, and especially with things that are going on, but if, uh, if I saw a, a police officer in a, in, a, in a restaurant that I was eating in, I would not, okay, I would not run up to that officer and try to wrestle the gun out of his holster. You know why? Because there's consequences to that. There's significant consequences. You know, ministry's messy. Ministry is risky. Ministry, there are consequences to ministry. There really are. Are consequences to it but do it anyway do it anyway one of the things that we're uh, uh, we are we are dealing with as a church that as we've grown as a church and as God is blessed and people have come in you know what we're dealing with now we've got more and more people and we need more and more people to step up into different varying levels of leadership and participation in the life of the church we need that and it's messy because some are new to the faith. Some just have grown relaxed and passive in their relationship with, the, with God. And so they're not geared up. They're not uh, ready to plug in to the fullness of what God desires. It's messy. But we're going to do it anyway. Another thing I've, I've known in a lot of, even some of the churches that I've pastored is as, as we begin to grow, there's uncomfortability because there's, a, there's shifting. Every time you have a body of believers that are together, there is a, a makeup of that body that gives it a distinctive personality, if you will. There's a DNA of that body. But when you introduce new people into that body, good or bad, it creates new personality. It gives new dimensions to the DNA of that local congregation. And we're dealing with that even now. And as a pastor, I've dealt with that time and time again where there are things that must take place. There are things that must we must deal with. We, we must adapt. See, ministry's messy. And there's a lot of people who don't like the messiness of ministry. They don't like the, 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 the difficulty that presents itself in having to change and having to adapt and having to say, we've got to get out there in the harvest and we're going to make this thing happen. We're going to minister in the name of Jesus and we want to see the harvest come in. But some people opt out because it's hard, because it's messy, because it's difficult, because it's awkward. Because I might have to give up something that's meaningful to me. Uh, something that might change that I feel strongly about. Sometimes we never accomplish anything because we never attempt anything. Too risky. Pastor, I don't want to do it. I've had people tell me before as a pastor, as, as we move forward, say, I'm, I, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to change that. I don't want to change that. I like the way this is right now. And, well, I do too. And there's some things that I've had to let go of that aren't comfortable for me. And I, there are some things that I've had to adjust to. And I've had to let go of those things because I, not, not truth, not biblical truth, 
The biblical truth is, though, if you want a clean stall, you're going for the wrong thing. If you want a manger that's un unmessed with and nobody bothers and it's just your little manger that you can feed out of and you can nourish your own soul from, then you'll have your own manger. And somewhere along the way, you'll find yourself by yourself and you'll recognize that the nourishment that you got was not from the Holy Spirit, but it was a nourishment that came from having your own way. Ministry's messy. And God often leads us to places that are uncomfortable. But Jesus is with us. He's Emmanuel. Jesus in the flesh will heal you when you're sick. Jesus will speak to us through the preaching and feed you when you're hungry. Uh, Jesus will provide for us uh, when we're, we're in need financially. He, he gave a, a coin in, in, the, in the mouth of the fish. And, and he says, take heart. Uh, uh, we have the Spirit of Christ with us. Uh, you know, one of the, the problems is we're a little preemptive about the promises of God. And there are some promises that will come to fruition when this life is over. And one of those promises is that it, in Scripture it talks about death as rest. In fact, it's kind of become almost cultural cliche, but when uh, oftentimes people say, uh, rest in peace. You know, and the only way you're going to rest in peace is if you've had a relationship with Jesus Christ before your death, before that point of physical death. That's only the only way that you can rest in peace. But we have his spirit to give this to us and make available to us. Here's the final point. Be a strong ox. Andy Addis uh, a pastor in Kansas said, there is some stuff worth fighting for even if I'm going to lose the fight. There's some stuff worth fighting for even if I'm going to lose the fight. After bloody noses and black eyes, people recognize, you know, that person, that man, that woman, they believe in something real. They're willing to pay the price for it. Uh, a level of endurance, a, a level of resolve. Not just that I'm going to make it to heaven. You need to have that. You need to be resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, but to move forward in Jesus Christ. But also resolve to say, I want to fulfill the will of God. I want to be a part of the Great Commission. And I'm, I want to be fruitful in this life to what God's called me to do. And so my goal is not going to be clean mangers, clean stables. I want a great harvest. And I'm going to be the ox that is strong and moves forward. And yeah, you know what? I'd rather fail attempting something for Jesus than be successful at nothing. At accomplishing nothing that impacts eternity. I don't want to be that Christian who goes through life comfortable, everything's nice, never ruffled anybody's feathers, made it through, but I didn't accomplish anything for the kingdom. And when I get to heaven one day, how can Jesus say, well done, thy good and faithful servant? Faithful to what? Your own comfort, your own preferences, your own ways. But I want to be a part of the kingdom work. Yes, that means I'm going to take extra time away from sitting in front of the television and soaking up more junk from Hollywood. I'm going to spend some more time in the Word of God. I'm going to spend some more time calling out to the Lord, not only for my own benefit, but for the kingdom work to go forward. And here I am, Father. Here I am, Lord. Send me, if you would. You know, as a pastor, I'll just tell you, there's been some times I've failed. There have been some times, no doubt, that I've led the church and led the people of the congregations that I was a part of, and uh, I led them through things that just didn't turn out well. There have been times, uh, I know these are all hard things for you to believe, there have been times where I've stood behind the pulpit and I've preached poorly. I take credit for that. That's not the Lord. That's me, whatever is poor about it there have been times that i've fumbled opportunity to share the gospel of jesus christ with people that i've interacted with that i can look back and say why did i miss that opportunity there have been times that i've i've hurt people with with words that i've said not intentionally but my desire my heart didn't always come through there are times that people have come to me 
and uh, as their pastor and wanted to sit in my office and counseled with them, maybe marriage counseling or maybe a relationship or just spiritually in a general sense. And there have been times where I came up short, couldn't help them, and couldn't do it. But I'll tell you one thing that I've not let go of. I have not let go of the fact that I believe that even in the hour in which I live at this very moment, with whatever failures and whatever shortcomings my past may have, I am absolutely convinced that the Great Commission call upon my life and the call of God upon your life is still present with us. And he's still saying, there's a harvest that's plentiful. And there are a few that would walk away from the conveniences of life to take the time and effort to be inconvenienced and do the work of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 7, a few chapters before where we were at, chapter 7, verse 22 says, All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fat. What if your work for the kingdom not only meant the awkwardness of dirty stalls and messed up mangers but what if it meant that you an ox to work in the harvest had to sacrifice something would it be worth it let me give you those four observations number one you should want a large harvest even though it's hard and messy Number two, clean stables are not the goal. Number three, we need, as God's people, to make a mess. We need to make a mess. Number four, be a strong ox. Number five, just do it. Just do it. I added that last one in. In a moment, I'm going to have you stand, and I'd like for there to be some kind of response today from some of you that would say I am willing to go where God wants me to go I'm willing to do what God wants me to do because I'm more concerned in fulfilling the great commission Jesus gave to his people and I'm willing to get messy I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and get down to it because it's often hard messy work but it will be worth it It will be worth it. Would you stand with me?